so here's question number one. about this one? Alright. Number four. <laughs> Last one, number six. No, you were late. No time for you. <laughs> Might be, <laughs> this might be our strategy to figure out how to get the pie. <laughs> I'm not even trying. Yeah, you are. It's fine. I haven't tried every year. I'm where I did try and I failed. So I just gave up. Is Rob's too cool to try? That's right. You wanted to? What does Dr. Mamel say? Good evening, Rob. Good evening, Here. I'm a nice guy, so we'll take it back. <laughs>
once again. Ready? And then number two. Okay. All right, we'll go over these at the end. Um, is that we did? Thank you. Anything you He wears glasses. He's recently diagnosed with ocular hypertension, and so he's on the Tanaprost. No really significant medical history sometimes takes artificial tears. So what would you want to know about this guy? What questions would you ask in the clinic? How long has this been going on, and how frequently does it happen? Yeah, so it's been going on for a few months now, um, and it happens probably every day, uh, maybe a couple times a day, but not necessarily. Any associated symptoms? No, no dizziness, no vertigo, no pain, nothing like that. It's really black, or is the shimmering uh, color white? It's black. He thinks it's black. But he notices that it's got like a shine to it. Any headache in the tree? He, he used to get a headache like once a year. Well, he gets a headache like once a year now. He used to have headaches when he was a teenager, but no longer gets frequent headaches. He used to get aura with his headaches. Can I draw what? A picture. Of his shimmering black spots? I uh, no. He says that once, like, if you ask him specifics, he'll say that once he was uh, weightlifting and he then, like, moved his head in a weird position and he saw, like, these splotches of, of black. Uh, he's not sure if it was in one or both eyes, but at that point it lasted for a little bit longer and then it went away, like a few seconds and then it went away. What is he doing when these come about? Well, that was one time he was weightlifting, but it's not necessarily associated with that. Okay, so he could be sitting down. He could be sitting down. What is the you ask him to do Well, we'll get to an exam in a second. But. <laughs> <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> But that's okay. That's okay. Uh, okay, so he's 20 20 in both eyes. He has an APD in the right eye, um, but his pupils are um, normally sized. His pressure is 18 in both eyes, and his ankles are open on gonioscopy, no elevation, no uh, evidence of PAS. Pregnant? Mm, mild. No. TIDs or anything? No TIDs. So let's dilate. You can ask about exam now. Oh, yes, yes, you can. Can you get a field? He, <laughs> we do have a field later. Um, this is what his optic nerves look like. How do people describe his nerves? It's like double vasculature or something. <laughs> <laughs> Very red. There's like, uh, it looks normal, but maybe anomalous vessels in the disc. He does seem to have, I, yeah. oh, like, he's a young, healthy guy. He does have a bunch of vessels. And yeah, that left eye does look kind of a little anomalous in the configuration of the vessels. 
Um, it's got a little bit of a sheen. He's young. I like it. And I don't know if this is right, but I always think about this, like, it looks like there's blurred margins. And so you always think, okay, blurred margins, oh, is this papilledema? And so th thinking of things that are like pseudopapilledema. So we start was just saying, I agree, it looks like maybe he has some, he has some truzen, optic nerve head truzen. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, here. oh, here, yeah. yeah. Anything over here? Not as much. So, again, yeah, autofluorescence. And he definitely did have drusen on an autofluorescence, so yes, very good. Um, and let's see, I think, oh yeah, he had also gotten, he had also told someone else that he'd had visual field defects, and so they got an MRI, and his MRI was pretty darn normal. Um, so this was uh, I, a case where the guy had had transient vision loss initially and then started having visual field defects later on. But just to talk about optic distrusion for a second in terms of how it can um, like cause transient vision loss. <coughs> distrusion is thought to be due to like impaired axonal transport and then the cells kind of die and extrude their contents and they get stuck and calcify. Um, I think that's a theory, but I think that's a well-established theory. Um, and then the drusen are mostly bilateral, but in his case they were asymmetric, so he did have an APD um, with regard to that. Um, and it's most often in uh, white, it's actually rare in non-white people. Um, you, so you can get an ultrasound to see if they're calcified drusen, autofluorescence was what worked for him. You could also get an OCT EDI um, to see if they're buried drusen. Um, he didn't have that. And then, um, as you said, we want to distinguish this from true papilledema. Um, and so, unlike the uh, disc leakage on fluorescent angiography that a true optic disc edema would have, there's none of that in optic distrusion. And I didn't know until recently that optic distrusion is associated with a few other ocular conditions. Does anyone know a couple of what those might be? Not that they're always found in these cases, just that they can be associated with it. Well, so I didn't... Yes, it is, because in rare cases, they can go on, and they, it is kind of like a risk factor for developing NION. I wasn't thinking of that one, but yes, you're absolutely right. So actually, two other ones are like retinitis pigmentosa and pseudoxanthoma elasticum are both associated with disc drusen. So in his case, to answer your question about the field strap, he did have a pretty large uh, peripheral arcuate defect in his right eye based on the, the drusen that was there. Okay, any questions about that case? Back to that photo again. Which uh, one? The uh, fundus photos. Okay. So I agree, his are not immediately obvious. They do look like his nerves are kind of weird and they look like they've got this pinkish stuff in the middle. But you can kind of see that on the edge, if you correlate it with where the drusen is on autofluorescence along this edge here, and you can kind of see that that's where a little bit of the margin is blurred and it does look a little bit no more nodular and bumpy there. I think everything's a little harder to see on disc photos too, rather than under slow Looking at it, probably true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, case two. So this is a 60-year-old uh, woman. She calls the page response line because she's been having intermittent blurry vision in her right eye. She says that she sees this like wax paper over her right eye and it's associated with this achiness. It's happened every night for the past four nights in the evening time and it lasts for about one or two hours at a time. Um, so she uh, sees a glaucoma doctor for um, asymmetric cupping. She's on latanoprost for that. Um, her pressures were recently checked like a week ago as 22 in the right eye and 14 in the left eye. Um, she has a history of hypertension and hypothyroidism. <coughs> One or two questions that you'd want to ask her? No diabetes. No diabetes. Is she faking? She is. How's her dry eye? She uh, has been on other glaucoma drops in the past and they've all caused this horrible irritation to her eyes. And so, yeah, her eyes are not at, her corneas are not in pristine condition. So right now she's kind of just been on the Tanaprost and only been able to tolerate that one. Good question. What's the achiness like? Uh, feels like it's um, on, her, on her brow, like she has this like brow ache. 
She sometimes does, rarely. Um, not that she can tell. Teary. No, not teary. She has noticed that her pupil is sometimes dilated when this happens, though. So we call her to come in for an exam. She's 20, she's still having an episode of wax vapor over her right eye when she comes in. She's 20, 80 in that eye, her pressure is 40. Um, she has no APD, um, but she's got microcystic edema in the central cornea of her right eye with one plus cell. Her angles are open on gonioscopy, and she has moderately cupped nerves more on the right than on the left. Um, so this is kind of an interesting case. It's not the classic ankle closure that can cause intermittent um, vi transient vision loss, but uh, in her case, she, the glaucoma team thinks she has this weird like inflammatory glaucoma, and when she has an episode of inflammation or pressure spikes, and she was off um, everything but the latanoprost at that time, and so her pressure just kept on going up. So eventually she, this is what she had been, she had recently had uh, the, this RNFL, so just a little bit of thinning, and then kind of an unreliable visual field on that right eye, but they thought maybe that she has some losses that could be associated with glaucoma. Um, but her uh, pressure was uncontrolled uh, off of drops, and she couldn't tolerate the drops, so she just got an Ahmed valve recently. She didn't have pseudo-X? She didn't, no. I don't know if they have a reason for why she has this, so it's kind of an unusual one. But, like, ankle absolutely can do this, and inflammation can do this. Okay. Um, just a couple more quick ones. 81-year-old woman comes to clinic because she's been having um, blackout vision in both eyes. She notices this when she gets up in the night to go to the bathroom and she turns on the light and she says, I just can't see. Um, and she doesn't think it happens without turning on a light or going from a dark room to a light room. She had cataract surgery 17 years ago. She wears reading glasses. She has a history of heart failure and uh, hypertension and her vision is 20-60-21-50. Any question that you'd want to ask her? Sorry, she turns. She t she goes into the bathroom. She turns the light on, and then she's like, "I just I just can't can't see anything." Probably lasts you know five minutes or so, and then it gets better. No eye pain. Head pain. No head pain. Jaw pain. <coughs> Excellent question. <coughs> no, no jaw pain. Does she feel like her vision has changed otherwise? Because her visual acuity is not very good. So. Uh, it hasn't. She knows that her vision isn't really good, but it has, that hasn't changed in a long time. I did her cataract surgery. <laughs> <laughs> 17 years ago? That was impressive. <laughs> so you dilate her, and she looks like this. So she's got a lot of drusen, and then she's got a whole bunch of geographic atrophy in the right eye, in the left eye in particular, but also in the right eye. Um, so what would you want to do to try to explain her episodes of vision loss? Medical stress test. Yeah, sounds like a good idea. How do you do a, a photo stress test? Try to light it in her eye and then uh, measure <laughs> visual acuity afterwards. Yeah, what would you be expecting to be normal? Um, More specific oh, no. than that. Yeah, I don't know. So, really sure. yeah. I don't want to volunteer. So you shine the light in their eye for, I believe it's 10 seconds, and then they should, a normal response is gaining two lines, at least two lines above their best corrected visual acuity in less than 90 seconds. I think it's 30, 30, 30 seconds. 28, I think, so, I think yeah. 30. I think like over 90 is for sure abnormal, right? Yes. And then it's yeah. like, I don't know. It should be yeah. Sure yeah, I think BCSC says. But I think you're right. I think um, they have to kind of have a, a visual acuity of like at least 2080 or so for this to work because if it's, you know, too high, then it's kind of a little bit harder to measure. But yeah, within, like, definitely normal is less than 30 seconds. They get down to within a line or two of what their uh, visual acuity was before. And if it's like 90 seconds to two minutes or something like that, you're definitely in the abnormal range of that's more of a macular problem. Whereas if it were a nerve problem, um, she would have a, she could have a normal macular stress test. So the other thing, I absolutely agree with you, Mike. I, if she has having transient vision loss in both eyes and she's 80 and she has any GCA symptoms, I would definitely get labs on her. But uh, if she doesn't, then I feel, feel like you can kind of explain this as uh, with a positive macular stress also test. Also, maybe you want to think about like ocular ischemic syndrome, vessel imaging. Yeah. Not that I think this looks like that, but it could be a little tricky because you'd be looking for cognitive spots and hemorrhages. But would you expect? Uh, ocular ischemic syndrome to have a, a abnormal or normal? Abnormal. Abnormal, good retinal issue, yeah, exactly. 
Okay, last case. Um, 46-year-old man comes to the ED because his left eye has been blurry since this morning. He had a, a kind of episodic bilateral blurry vision when he was exercising a few days ago. These are all exercising vision loss, sorry guys. Um, but at this time, his vision has not returned to normal. Um, he occasionally wears reading glasses. He has a history of MS that was diagnosed uh, seven months ago. He's on Copaxone, um, but he was not sure that the Copaxone was doing anything, and so he's doing this experimental um, intranasal stem cell injections up his nose where they tried to get to his brain, and the last one was four days ago. This is a true story. So in his case... His vision was 20-20 in the right eye, 20-30 in the left eye. Color vision was down in the left. He has a left APD. This is before I knew how to measure APDs, so I don't know what it was logarithmically. Um, he has full motility, but he has pain on abduction of his left eye and his normal DFE. So you're seeing him in the ED on consults. It's July. What do you want to do? Yeah, sure. Or ask him. <laughs> You know, his episode of MS was when, the only one that he's had so far was um, when he had uh, numbness and uh, weakness of his hand, and he was found to have a cervical spinal cord lesion and some demyelinating lesions in his brain at that time. That's the uh, only time he's had an episode, you said? That's the only time he's had an episode. Yeah. Already gone for these intranasal stem cell injections. He's had two of them, the stem cell thing. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. Is he regularly having top phenomenon? What's Utah's phenomenon? Um, so, with people who have patients of MS, when they get overheated, they can have various neurological deficits and weakness, you know, or even transit vision loss. Episode. Yeah, so actually, that's a good question. So, when he had his uh, like first MS flare seven months ago, he did say that he was very heat intolerant. His weakness would get worse when he was uh, a little bit you know, warmer or trying to exercise. And he did have some blurry vision occasionally, like episodically during his previous episode of MS in both eyes. He almost returned to normal. After that at flare went away, it went back. This time it always will return until right now and the left eye hasn't gone back. How long has it not been normal now? It's been about eight hours or so. It was this morning and now it's evening time. Only when he moves his eye, ab abducts his left eye, but yes, he does. Mm -mm, no double vision. He says, my left eye has always been my better eye and now it's definitely my worst eye. So let's pretend the stem cells aren't there or what would you guys say this is? Right. Yeah. So he had an MRI. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, enhancement on the orbital portion of the optic nerve, but you can see on the uh, canalicular and like prechiasmal part that his left optic nerve was brightly lit up compared to his right. So he was admitted for salumedrol. Um, the stem cells were just why he came in because he thought that was what had caused it. But um, he was then, um, he had a workup for NMO, which the Alcaport 4 antibody was negative, and then he was supposed to follow up an MS clinic, and he never did. So I don't know what happened to him. Back to the MRI. Sure, yeah. Uh, uh, in the uh, coronal section on the left side, mm -hmm. there seems to be like a dark spot, like underneath the vasculature. Is that just, just how it happens to look? This below, part here? Below that, inferior, inferior, and medial. And inferior, and inferior, and inferior, and medial, and medial. Yeah, that like this whole circle, like inferior to where. Do you know what I'm saying? I like go, keep going down, down, yeah. down, down. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! I see what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how to interpret that. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Can you point out the optic nerve? For oh, sorry. So his uh, right optic nerve is right here. His left optic nerve is right there. So just some brief things about optic neuritis, Utah's phenomenon, so I've already described that one. They think that it's because of these like weird funky sodium channels that are affected um, and kind of abnormal after demyelination. Um, I don't know if that's proven though either. The other thing that optic neuritis patients can get are like these phosphines, which are basically flashes and photisms, 
where they like hear a noise, like the doorbell rings, and then they see a light in response to that. So this kind of like strange wiring that can happen after an episode of object neuritis. And it does happen in about three quarters of MS patients at some point in their disease course. And sometimes it's the presenting symptom in like a quarter to a third of, a quarter to a fifth of patients or something like that. All right, I think that's all I have. Yeah. Okay, so let's start off with a case. I just have this one case. I'll just read it out loud. So patient presented to his optometrist following an episode of transient vision loss in his left eye. He describes a slow blurring and darkening of the vision of the left eye with a similarly gradual return to normal. The whole episode lasted 10 minutes. He described similar episodes every two to three months for the previous three years with no associated uh, migranous aura or headache and exercise was not a trigger in this point. And so um, this is not meant to trick you at all. So this is actually a really cool case report I found. So this is um, his fundus photo of the left eye before the episode. And then they actually caught one during the episode here. So you can see kind of diffuse retinal whitening along the inferior and superior arcades. And then um, this is 10 minutes after the episode. And so um, we're gonna come back to this case, so just kinda like keep that in mind. But uh, to start off, um, I'm kinda gonna go over uh, transient um, monocular vision loss secondary to more anatomical reasons. And so I wanted to start off with just like the anatomy of um, just basic anatomy of the vasculature of the eye. So we have the internal carotid artery, and of course that branches off um, to have uh, to the ophthalmic artery, and then that further branches off to the posterior ciliary arteries, and then the central retinal artery. And the next slide, I have a kind of a better picture here where we can see um, the central retinal artery coming from the ophthalmic artery, and then the short posterior ciliary arteries coming um, to kind of feed the choroid. Um, and then just remember that it's the central retinal artery that kind of gives off these collateral branches that feed the optic nerve. And this becomes important in a couple of different disease states that we'll be talking about. Um, so central retinal artery and posterior ciliary arteries are end arteries and reduced perfusion in either of these will affect the retina. Um, so the territories actually overlap, which is a safety zone for the optic nerve head, but it also creates a watershed zone in the retina. Does anybody know what layer in the retina this watershed zone is? Rob, I know you know. Internuclear, yeah. We talked about that like my intern year, I think. You taught it to me. Now I'm teaching it to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's the inner nuclear layer um, that you have this uh, watershed zone. So when you're evaluating somebody with transient um, monocular vision loss, I think it, we can gauge a lot through history, which... I don't know about you guys, but that's not necessarily why I went into ophthalmology, but in neuro-ophthalmology, we do talk to the patients and it has a lot to do like how the vision loss occurs. And so the pattern of vision loss may give a clue to the diagnosis. So when you're talking about altitudinal vision loss, so when they describe this kind of veil, shutter, shade, or dimming, this was actually a study that I read, sorry I didn't reference it, um, but these are the four most common um, symptoms or ways to describe people's symptoms 
um, when it is actually this altitudinal vision loss. And that is strongly suggestive of a vascular etiology. So this is opposed to like a constrictive vision loss. So when you have this altitudinal vision loss, very, very strongly suggestive of a vascular etiology. Um, and then we, we talk about positive or negative symptoms. So positive being um, scintillations or photopsias. And then uh, negative symptoms being um, black or gray. This gray is kind of up for argument. There's, once again, like this other paper that was all about gray being a positive versus negative symptom. It was very riveting. But uh, I think they kind of concluded that gray was maybe a negative <laughs> symptom. But nonetheless, these negative symptoms are, you know, this isn't a hard and fast rule, black and white, but negative symptoms do often um, lead one to believe that it's more of a vascular etiology rather than, um, you know, a cerebral migraine, migraine kind of etiology. Um, for migraines, what do people have? Do they have positive or negative symptoms generally? Positive, positive exactly, yeah. Um, okay, so this is kind of a really cool drawing of a patient that experienced transient monocular vision loss. So he describes, you know, his whole vision going gray, or let's just say that's black for the lack of, we don't have, you know, black as a negative symptom. And then this is kind of how his vision came back, kind of like in these white blobs. What, what artery do you think was um, occluded to make, I'm telling you that this is in fact caused by like an arterial occlusion. What do you guys think actually caused this? Central retinal artery from like amyurosis, like from a pollock source? No. Exactly. Yeah, so that's, yeah, it's exactly what this is, is because you got to remember the posterior ciliary artery kind of branches and it has all of these tiny other branches that feed the choroid. And so this is basically the choroid reperfusing. And so I just thought it was a really cool, this was actually drawn by a patient when he was describing his visual loss. And so, um, you know, people can also describe these like lobules, blackout vision with these lobules of vision reappearing. Um, and then of course evaluation. So looking at the patient's eyes, this isn't as valuable in a lot of these transient monocular vision losses because unlike the photo, yeah. I think it's compared to like what would look like was actually a central retina artery more like a like a curtain yeah yeah and especially like the reperfusion of it too it's going to be kind of like a, you know like whitening coming out not so much like these blobs appearing back in the vision is that real that's like that is a that's something that's been shown yeah, so they actually published a whole article about that. I mean, it's really hard because you, we don't catch these people in the act a lot of the times of these, like, transient monocular vision losses. But um, at least with this, with the posterior ciliary arteries, I don't know about the central retinal artery if it's been, like, evidence proven or not. This kind of sounds like something people would just say. Like, well, yeah, that's the po that's the point of this is this is not like this is what patients say and how it can help like us further evaluate what the patient has, you know, like they're. Uh, yeah. What would cause like a posterior ciliary artery occlusion? We'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah, um, and then evaluating the anterior segment and the posterior segment can be really helpful too. Um, I, I spoke about this just last week, so I don't want to go too much into depth about ocular ischemic syndrome, but that's one um, cause of transient monocular vision loss that can actually have physical exam findings. So we can have iris neovascularization, we could have anterior chamber inflammation. Um, and can someone describe the anterior chamber inflammation seen in ocular ischemic syndrome? in terms of like the cell and flare. It just has a little more flare in the cell. Yeah, so it's flare out of proportion to cell, definitely an ocular ischemic syndrome. Um, and then the posterior segment evaluation. So um, let's see, Marshall, what, what do you see here in this fundus photograph? Mid peripheral hemorrhage. 
Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of like the classic um, uh, physical exam finding for ocular ischemic finding, uh, ocular ischemic syndrome. Uh, you could also have cotton wool spots. You could also have flame hemorrhages as well, but these kind of mid-peripheral doplot hemorrhages are kind of classic for um, ocular ischemic syndrome. And then, um, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but you know, with ocular ischemic syndrome, as I talked about in FA um, last week, you have um, dilated but not tortuous veins because the tortuous veins are found in which, which type of etiology? CRVO, exactly. Yeah, so you have uh, dilated, non-tortuous veins and then kind of attenuated ar um, arteries. Um, and then trigger factors is a big key that uh, patients with transient monocular vision loss can kind of lead you to the diagnosis. So gaze evoked transient monocular vision loss is a tumor in the orbit until proven otherwise. And so in this article, Pezzled et al. described that optic nerve sheath meningiomas are actually the most common cause of gaze evoked transient monocular vision loss. Um, and then bright lights leading to uh, vision loss. Uh, think of ipsilateral internal carotid artery occlusion. And I, I wanted to put this in here because I misspoke last week and my explanation for bright lights leading to vision loss in ocular ischemic syndrome was that it requires more blood flow to kind of feed those uh, photoreceptors, which then cause this ischemia, which then causes these dim outs. But in this article, the physiological mechanism underlying this observation is not entirely clear because in diabetes, it has been shown that dark and not light causes hypoxia in the retina, leading to the suggestion that sleeping with lights on may have a neuroprotective effect on eyes with diabetic retinopathy. Sleep with their eyes open? Yeah. <laughs> so, I, do you, can you comment on that, Dr. C? I have not heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I've never heard of any retina doctor recommending a, a patient to sleep with their lights on. But <laughs> just something to think about. Your chambers for all. What's that? Your chambers yeah, for all. exactly. Okay, so diagnostic workup. Um, so most patients are not observed during the attack. Um, the rare situation with the case that I talked about in the beginning, this patient happened to be. So you really have to dig deep, talk about the onset, talk about the way their vision went away, the way it came back, um, aggravating factors. Um, of course, EKG is really important, ESR, CRP, super important, especially in individuals over the age of 60. Remember that ESR is normal in 5 to 30% of individuals with GCA. And then, of course, a DFE, um, you know, looking for visible emboli, disc edema, disc pallor, attenuated retinal arteries, cotton wool spots, and attenuated veins. Um, this is kind of an old-fashioned technique, just something I think we should know about. So um, when you're applying digital pressure and uh, the transient monocular vision loss is due to hypoperfusion, um, you expect that the arteries are going to collapse, um, right? Whereas if they, they normally wouldn't collapse. But there's one other etiology that actually has this same physical exam finding that is not um, hypoperfusion. Can, does anyone know what that is? Blackout when you apply digital pressure. No, when you apply digital pressure, you're seeing the arteries collapse. So like high IOP, yeah, so like no, I know, but it's just tricky because if the patient has already high IOP and you apply digital pressure and you see the arteries collapse, you can like think of that to be like hypoperfusion from another source as opposed to from glaucoma, like high pressure. So just be aware of that if they have high pressures and you apply digital pressure, it might collapse. So ESR is normal in 5 to 30% of people with GCA? Yes. And at the VA, don't they not have like a normal CRP available to test? Yes. So what do we do? Like how do you rule out 
Just well, you, that, that's never how you rule it out, right? No, Ooh, that's, that's just that's a that, screening uh, test. If you're suspicious, you start on steroids and schedule them for a temporary temporal artery biopsy. I feel like sometimes, uh, like, I'm asked to just, like, order ESR, like, like labs for GCA when we're not really suspicious at all, just because they're old, you know? Well, it's, so it's, it's kind of like the sensitivity and specificity, right? So it's got a high sensitivity, but low specificity. So if you're actually that concerned that a patient has GCA, then you, like, you should... But, but it sounds like it's low sensitivity also. I mean... So, so he's right, though. It's all about like pre-test yeah. probability. Yeah. So depending on your level of suspicion, you know, be smart about ordering this test because you're right. You can open up a can of worms. If you have really low suspicion someone doesn't, you know, have GCA and then you order this, then what do you do? You're stuck. Like, you backed yourself into a corner. So I, I'm not sure if you're saying, like, I other... I feel like this test is not super useful, I guess. In, yeah, so people in just order it to, you know, make themselves feel better. Yeah. You want to know it's more yeah. useful. No systemic symptoms, and you've got a normal ESR, CRP. That's really reassuring. But if for some reason that comes back elevated, you can totally have giant cell without any systemic symptoms. So if this comes back elevated, then that would probably push you to do a temporary biopsy in, in the absence of systemic symptoms. Or an ultrasound. <laughs> <laughs> to guide your biopsy. <laughs> <laughs> okay um oh shoot i forgot to pull this up i think this is um i think this is dr degree's thing it's really cool because once again you're kind of caught So this is actually, you can see ret, like emboli in the retina, which is like super cool. They look like, so look look down here and up here. That's where I saw them the most. Like, yeah, you see that one down there? They go really fast. It's a really terrible video. Yeah, you see that one? It's like shooting stars. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so like we never see that, but it'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Whoa, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really cool video to watch when you guys have free time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I watched it a lot yesterday. Okay, uh, so back to our case. So what what's on the differential for that guy um, that I talked about? So, yeah, what do you guys think? How old was he? I don't want to tell you. <laughs> no, he was young. I took that out on purpose, actually. It was in the case, but he was young. He was like 22 years old. Yeah, I would have just given it away. What happened in the case? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he would need it, too, if he was using it. No. Oh, my God. This is the first slide. I forgot. Twenty-two. Okay, what's on the differential? Vasospasm. No, it's probably too long. Hmm. Vasos. Yeah, perfect. Vasospasm. Okay. Awesome. What else? Yeah, definitely. Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, yes, that's why I took out the age, because I wanted us to kind of expand the differential. Likely not in a 22-year-old, but Section. definitely something. Di yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So embolism, retinal vein occlusion, GCA, not in a 22-year-old. Hyperperfusion, migraine aura without headache or retinal vasospasm. And I want to I want to spend just like the last two minutes talking about retinal vasospasm because I feel like for me this is the one out of all of these that I don't know a lot about. And it's um, I think it's oh yeah this was some other test here. He did get this like whole workup. So 
NLP during the episode recovered to 2030, no visual field abnormality, no hematological abnormality, and carotid cardiac investigations were normal. So retinal migraine. So the term was introduced in 1970, maybe by Dr. Degree, who knows? But um, so the definition, the International Headache Society stipulated in 1987 that in retinal migraine, a headache follows visual symptoms with a free interval of less than 60 minutes, but may precede them. So essentially, headache can go before or after the visual symptoms. And then obviously, the diagnostic criteria for retinal migraine, you must rule out any other etiology. You can't just call something a retinal migraine because it could actually be something that can kill them very quickly. Um, and I thought this was really cool. Uh, so systematic review, they studied 142 patients that were diagnosed with retinal migraine, and they concluded the diagnosis was probably wrong in the majority, with convincing evidence in only 16 cases. Importantly, all of these suffered from headaches, and the absence of a personal or family history of headaches suggested of migraine. Caution should be exercised before making a diagnosis of retinal migraine. And the reason why I put this up there is for, the main reason is because you have to understand that the, the pathophysiology behind a retinal migraine is actually vasospasm of the retinal arteries, but the, uh, the incidence of migraines and retinal vasospasm is highly, highly correlated. They're not, they're not really sure why, but those are very much correlated. So without that history, you need to rethink your diagnosis. Um, so facts about retinal migraine, uh, monocular vision loss for 10 to 20 minutes, it's a diffuse or unilateral headache, exercise is generally precipitates the attack, so that's something different about our case, um, and it's caused by vasospasm of the retinal circulation or ophthalmic artery. Um, treatment is propranolol and the fetipine or verapamil. If patients are having this all the time, you could prophylactically treat them with aspirin or nifedipine to prevent these exercise-induced attacks. And then I had a, a couple other things about GCA, but um, I'm not going to, well, we're running out of time. So just one thing I wanted to mention about GCA is that um, although most of them present with arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, Remember that this can also include posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, CRAO, BRAO, choroidal infarction, CNS stroke, or diplopia. The pathophysiology is exactly the same in all of these. Um, so vasculitis within the elastin of the small or medium to large arteries. Um, but they can present like this, normal fundus finding. But then you look here and this patient had a choroidal infarction secondary to GCA. So just because the fundus looks okay, it doesn't completely rule out GCA. So in this, sorry, I know I we're running, but in this one, you're saying that this would have been like a posterior choroidal artery problem. Yes. So how come in the case that you're talking about at first, like that guy had retinal whitening during his first, I mean, it would have had to have been more than just the posterior artery. Yeah, arm. definitely. Oh, okay. It was probably, it was probably like a, a branch off the central retinal, or maybe it was okay. even the CRAO. They didn't talk about which artery it was. But yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, they say that most of the time, like GCA, it, GCA doesn't only affect one vessel, right? Like if you're, if you have symptoms of GCA, you're having all, a lot of medium to large size arteries affected. So most of the time we do see, you know, not most, but you know, something on exam, some disc edema, anything like that. Okay, Teresa, you're up. Is this... Um, vision loss. Really quick here. Okay, diagnosis. Migraine. Okay, good. Why? Tell, tell me how do patients describe these whenever they have them based on the pictures? Flashing lights in their peripheral. So scintillation, that's like where that comes from, yeah. right? The scintillation and then the scotoma, which you can see kind of in the middle picture. So what about this, like, di I was wondering, I was like, what's this, like, fortification spectra, if you guys read this? And it's like, so that is, like, the picture on the right. And so kind of, like, there's some zigzagging lines there, and it was thought to res um, re resemble, like, the wall outside of an old medieval city and the, like, battlements up on the top. And so that's, like, along historically where that name comes from. 
So migraine, this is probably the most common thing that's gonna cause a transient binocular vision loss. However, most patients are prob probably gonna see it as just unilateral, even though it affects both eyes. Um, and so you can see these, you know, with the eyes open and with the eyes closed, um, classically. So usually linear, geometric, um, and then the classic migraine aura is, like I said, that fortification spectra. It tends to be black, white, or monochromatic. Um, and it will enlarge over several minutes. So Dr. Degree in her headache lecture last week talked to us about how do you tell the difference between a TIA and a migraine? Do you guys remember what she said with vision changes? Yeah, absolutely. And then there was one more thing, particularly with, with timing. Do you guys remember what she said? And then, or the, and then the onset. So the onset, um, sorry, I should say onset. So the onset with a TIA is sudden, whereas the onset with a migraine is going to gradually kind of come on and build and build and build and build. So that can be helpful in distinguishing TIA versus migraine in the history. Um, so they can also describe heat waves or tunnel vision, and they can have micropsia. Sorry, that's in micropsia. Um, so small and big vision, kind of the Alice in Wonderland effect as well. Um, so they're always usually less than an hour. If they're more than an hour, you should be suspicious that something else is going on. It's rare that they're um, outside of that. And then the associated symptoms, right? Headache, nausea, vomiting, sound and light sensitivity. Okay, what's your diagnosis here? White dots. <laughs> okay, so positive or negative? Positive. Okay, what about, the, what about the characteristics of the picture? There's a pinwheel, right? And then what do you notice about the... the uh, There's like stars the that's like formed. Yeah, what about the, the... Is it black, white, or colorful? Colorful. Okay, what does that make you think of? Like brain stuff. Good. <laughs> Epilepsy. <laughs> Seizure. Nice job, Brad. So occipital seizures, um, so these are typically unformed positive visual phenomena. So there's a whole other section on hallucinations for patients where they can have formed visual, hallucin uh, formed visual hallucinations in a lot of different diseases, and that's in a completely different chapter in the BCSC that we're not covering today. But classically, these are colored swirling lights. A whiteout of vision can also be described with bubbles or a flash bulb going off, circles and spherical patterns. So that was actually a patient that um, just wrote, drew a picture of what he saw when he was having his occipital seizure. Generally, these are very rare. Um, motion tends to be a frequent characteristic with them, and then they can have visual distortion. And classically, they're going to be in the contralateral or lateral visual field to the side of the, the seizure. Um, and they can be have negative visual symptoms. So these are going to grow over seconds in contrast to migraine aura, which grows over minutes. And of course, they're more um, vivid. And you can think of it this way. So a post-ictal headache is actually a common feature of occipital epilepsy. So just because a patient has a very vivid migraine aura and has a headache afterward, you need to be thinking about um, occipital seizure instead. And then their insights usually always intact to this, but then your associated symptoms are a little bit different than a migraine. So deja vu, somatosensory phenomenon, head and eye deviation, um, motor activity, and impaired consciousness. And so here you want to get an EEG and neuroimaging is indicated. Um, so adults with this usually harbor a structural lesion, whereas children it's usually benign. Okay, diagnosis. Stroke. Patient come. Hmm? Stroke. Mm -hmm. Where? Right side. Where? <laughs> How far? It's macular spare. Okay, so what's the, um, describe the visual loss to me. Is it positive or negative? Negative. Okay. Less. So negative symptoms, you always want to think about um, occipital ischemia. So complete binocular transient vision loss may represent a TIA that involves the occipital lobes. Um, so I think this is kind of another thing that maybe requires a little bit more explanation. So um, you have, there's a lot of blood vessels that, and our visual cortex takes up, like our visual system takes up so much of our brains that there's a lot of different blood vessels that can supply it. Supply, supply it. And so obviously you can think about the PCA territory with the occipital lobe, but also the basal artery is also um, intimately involved in supplying the system. So if a patient had 
vertebral basilar system disease, you're going to see more complex deficits. So what kind of symptoms do you see in a patient that has like a vertebral basilar symptom um, or vertebral basilar stroke? Mm -hmm. Instability. So ataxia, imbalance, staggering. Um, what about other symptoms? Nystagmus. Nystagmus. So oculomotor disturbances, so gaze palsies, INOs, skews, cranial nerve palsies, nystagmus, all those things within the system too. Um, they can also have gray out or white out of their vision that last seconds and can have positive flickering um, stars. Um, and then also hemiparesis, hemiplegia, and hematosensory deficits. And then also the bulbar symptoms, so dys dysarthria and dysphagia. Um, so these will typically last minutes. They're going to be an older patient with vascular risk factors, and they have a sudden onset um, in contrast to migraine. And then they can even have a headache in the brow contralateral to their hemianopia. So, um, you know, just because you have a headache afterwards doesn't mean it's all the automatically migraine. Okay, and then really quick, not a visual uh, hallucination, but this is actually a painting that's in the National Gallery of Art. It's called The Faint. So um, I was looking through and I was like, I remember this painting from somewhere. So really quick, I just wanted to touch on hypoperfusion. Um, so anything associated with postural hypertension or basal vagal presyncope, has anyone ever passed out before? So I had passed out in the OR this year for like the first time and had the like, whew, um, which was really interesting. And then Stokes Adams attacks. So that's where a patient has an underlying cardiac dysrhythmia and then doesn't um, like a heart block and doesn't perfuse um, their whole head. Um, and so most commonly these episodes are going to occur while standing. Um, if they're occurring while the patient's sitting, um, then you can think about something else. So with the vasovagal and postural hypertension. Okay, and then last, um, so one thing that we kind of talked about was occipital mass lesions. And so you can also have episodic headaches and bilateral transient vision loss with these. Um, so I think this is kind of another thing too, um, where you would want to have a field to evaluate it. Um, but tumors and AVMs can also present in the back with um, transient vision loss. So it's kind of the same picture as before. Okay. All right, Chris Bear. All right, let's just review our quiz real quick for the sake of time, and then let's get to clinic. Um. All right, so for the sake of time, we'll just skip the rest of this stuff here. Um, we've talked about a lot of this. History is important. There's some questions to ask. Exam is important. So testing. We'll skip all this. This is a nice uh, just differential for trans vision loss. I can send that to you if you're interested. All right. So um, our first question, um, young woman, uh, some wide out supervision, a little bit of uh, discomfort when she has these. What do you guys think the answer is? Pro most appropriate next step. A. So I have two answers: B and A. Um, B. Do B first. Exactly. So I agree the most appropriate next step would be goniascopy because we're concerned about intermittent angle closure in someone like this with these kind of presenting symptoms. So goniascopy would be the next best step and then we can pursue other things as needed, but goniascopy is the appropriate next step. Um, number two, um, so 65 year old guy, hypertension, smoking, um, transient episodes of vision loss um, that mostly occur in brightly lit environments. So most important test to perform. So I, I, I agree, magnetic stress test wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, maybe this is a poorly worded question, but the most important test is vessel imaging because, uh, oops, that, that's wrong. The most, important test is vessel, <laughs> the most important test is vessel imaging because like Brad said, we're concerned about, this is light induced amaurosis. So we're concerned about um, vascular problems and specifically in the carotids. And so vascular imaging would be the most important thing to do here. Um, most common cause of transient bilateral uh, vision loss. Migraine, exactly. Great. Um, Twenty-eight year old woman, um, headaches, transient vision loss, um, headaches worse with lying down, associated with nausea, um, and so she's been taking Accutane. And so, uh, what does she have first, and then what would be the thing that's not consistent with her most likely diagnosis? So we think she has IH, right? And so, which of these would not be consistent with the diagnosis of IH? 
the exact is you can have papilledema, you can have MRI with empty cell, and you can have a cranial nerve 6 palsy, but cranial nerve 4 palsy would make us think about other things, so we wouldn't expect that. Absolutely. Uh, number five, uh, six-year-old woman, hypertension, transient episodes of vision loss, she's had vertigo, um, and she's had these episodes when she's at her hair salon getting her hair done. Um, she thinks it's monocular, but she hasn't checked. So what's the most likely source of her pathology? D. D, exactly, exactly. Um, so this is vertebral basal insufficiency that Rich was just talking about. Um, and I put in there the thing about the hair salon because this kind of in the literature you can hear it as like beauty salon or beauty parlor thing because as you have extension of your neck while getting your hair done, you can have um, episodes of hyperperfusion causing these symptoms. So um, ask about where they get their hair done. Um, and then finally, uh, you have an 80-year-old guy, hypertension, diabetes, he has a new floater, kind of a black spot that comes and goes, and he had this episode of transient double vision a few weeks ago. Um, he's got a PVD with multiple floaters, so what's the most appropriate next step for this guy? D. D. I agree. So even though he's got vitreous floaters, he's got what he describes as a spot, um, you know, his symptoms are concerning for... Um, potentially GCA, and we need to make sure we rule that out. And so um, getting the ASR to CRP would be the most appropriate next step um, out of all these options here. Any questions on any of these? Okay, great, let's go to clinic.